Good morning, uh, dear colleagues in Italy, and that includes, of course, uh, Director General Bratti, uh, President Stefano Laporta, the Minister, and not least uh, President Sassoli and uh, the Prime Minister Conte. It is, a, it is a pleasure and an honor to share the findings of the State and Outlook of the Environment Report 2020. And as has been mentioned before, this is not the first uh, report that we are doing. Every five years, and this for the sixth time in a row, we bring together our best knowledge about the European environment and climate, and we link it to policy performance in Europe. And that is exactly what we did in this report. What is different uh, in this report is, I think, the context. The European Green Deal is probably the most fertile ground that we have had in 25 years of reporting to come with this type of knowledge. And I think the report is a strong science-based and data-based underpinning of why indeed we have to go to a low carbon circular economy with strong natural capital and biodiversity, focus on limiting pollution for human health and the health of the environment, but also doing it in a way that stimulates the economy and social justice. All of those are critical elements of the European Green Deal, as was also explained by President Ursula von der Leyen in her intervention. It also means that this report is not just a report, it is part of a process. It is part of a process with very strong political engagement, also towards the post-corona uh, time period. It is a report that intends to provide strong policy support but also wants to be useful for stakeholders, those involved in actually making the changes that will be needed if we want to become more uh, sustainable at a European level. It was already mentioned by the minister that indeed we are not detached from global uh, evolution. If you look at the, the global panels of scientists that bring knowledge to global policymaking settings, we can look at the IPCC report on climate change, which has been very clear on the necessity to absolutely live up to the Paris Agreement commitments of staying well below two degrees and preferably aim for 1.5 degrees centigrade. The IPBES, the Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystems, has been warning about what it's called the sixth great extinction, the loss of species and biodiversity on this planet. And the lesser known but not less important International Resource Panel is looking at our resource use and how it impacts the two previous elements. All of these reports come to very similar conclusions. First of all, urgent action is needed. This is indeed a pivotal decade to turn things around. Secondly, we are already dealing with irreversibilities, which means that we are at a stage where we are actually dealing with damage and we are trying to limit the damage in this irreversible new type of planetary environment. On top of that, we are witnessing tipping points which are potentially speeding up negative change and that puts another emphasis on the urgency and these things are interconnected, which means that if we fail on climate change, we will fail on biodiversity and the other way around and if we don't change our resource use, we will fail on those two as well. To illustrate this, I would like to show this little, since the late 19th century, we see the temperature fluctuating on the planet. And some climate skeptics would say, well, it is indeed clear that uh, this is a natural system with lower and higher temperatures. It's happening after World War II, and we are now into the 1970s when Mao dies in China and we start to see what we call now globalization. And we are around the turn of the century now. And we go to 2010 and we are now in 2017. I think the planet is rather clear. Business as usual is no longer the case. Even if some think still today that business as usual is a policy option, it is clearly not an ecosystemic option. On to the European level now. In our State and Outlook of the Environment report, 
we look at the past trends of European policies and how they relate to the qualities of the environment. And we call this the piano of the European environment. And each key, you could say, is a set of policies for which we have data that we collect together with our partners in the countries. And I think it's clear that where we are moving in the right direction is where we are moving towards a more low carbon and resource efficient economy. Yeah? Where we are failing for the most part is on protecting the fundamental natural capital on this planet. And if you look towards the future, 2030, and that is the span also of the European Green Deal in first instance, it's obvious that the green disappears. Now, for a region that is world leading in environment and climate policies, this cannot be the goal. And the message here is not that European policies are not working. The core message is that the systems of production and consumption, which are the fundamental drivers of unsustainability, are in many cases stronger than the more segmented policies that we have taken until now. The other message is, of course, that the future does not have to look like this. If we make the right policy choices, we would see much less red and much more green. And that is, of course, the objective of the European Green Deal. Let's first look at natural capital, the foundational capital. Well, if you look at past trends, the first column, we see that in many cases, European policies have not shown uh, to result in positive trends. The two green ones is where we are protecting more nature areas, and that is, of course, a very positive evolution. But if you look at the 2020 column there for policy objectives and targets, we, we see actually that there is a big implementation gap. And that is not the role of the institutions in Brussels. This is the role of the national institutions, where in many cases we still see lacking implementation of what we have all agreed to at the European level. And this results, of course, also in trend lines that are not necessarily very positive. We see a, re a, sm a slowdown in the loss of bird species, especially when it comes to forest bird species that are uh, rebounding a bit. But if we look at farmland birds, we see a decline in the last 25 years of 32%. The same is true with pollinators, and we take here the grassland butterflies as the, the core index with a decline of 40%. And if you look at the habitats data, you see that most habitats in Europe are not in good shape. So these are indicators of natural capital that is not going in the right direction in many places. And it is also clear in very important parts of these, this natural capital like water bodies, where a large number of them in Europe are actually in poor ecological status. And this is due to pollution. This is due to water abstraction, which is increasingly under conditions of climate change an issue, but also uh, some changes, physical changes and hydrological pressures on water bodies. So we still have a long way to go to reach good ecological status in Europe's river basins. And the importance of water, I think, to all of us is very clear. If we look at land and soil, and you could say this is fundamental for all human activities, a healthy land and soil system, this is also under multiple pressures. If we look at land and soil and the, the spatial pattern of uh, how we see losses of land uh, that is uh, being covered by concrete or lost due to other activities, this is the map of Europe. And it's clear that where the pressures are, it's either urban sprawl, but it's also uh, the increase in infrastructure, increased landscape fragmentation, which also has a big impact on biodiversity and the potential for biodiversity and ecosystems to rebound, but also soil degradation and contamination. We are losing the vibrant and necessary capacities of soil biodiversity through the practices that we have in terms of uh, agricultural practices, but also other land uses, as I have mentioned. When it comes to resources, and as I said, resources are critical 
uh, when we think of uh, biodiversity and climate change, we look at the following picture. We are indeed moving in Europe more and more towards a resource efficient and circular economy and also a low carbon economy. I will come back to that. But there are still some issues, as I can show at the lower part of the 2020 policy objectives, where we have poor implementation. And that is mostly on emissions from chemicals and on water uh, when it comes to uh, the use uh, of that. One good message is indeed that we see recycling rates in Europe generally improving. And I, I put the red box around Italy, with Italy one of the countries where we see very significant improvements between 2004 and 2017. So that is good news. The other uh, element, however, is that if you look at the evolution of the European gross domestic product, we still see that waste generation outpaces the average pollution. So we produce more waste, but we recycle it better. That is the mixed picture that we have to deal with. And if we really want to go to a circular economy and a low carbon economy, we will have to uh, reverse the trend of waste generation. Good news is that resource efficiency, which means that we produce more economic output per kilo of uh, domestic material consumption, is uh, improving quite significantly. And Italy here is a country that, again, has made very significant improvements over the last uh, 20 years. And overall, we see an increase in Europe of 40%. The flip side of the coin is that if we look at the circular economy, that we are at this moment only at 12% of circular material use in Europe. And we see a very slow improvement. So the circular economy 2.0 package, which is an integral and critical part of the European Green Deal, uh, should really bend the curve here and stimulate the breakthrough of a really circular use of materials in Europe. Climate change, we have mentioned it already as one of the most important challenges of our times and of the next century. And if we look at where we are there, I think the positive news is that with the reference year 1990, that Europe has in fact been successful in cutting emissions. We have cut domestic emissions by minus 23%, while we've seen the European economy grow by almost 60%, which means that decoupling your greenhouse gas emissions from economic performance is possible. We will reach the 2020 targets on greenhouse gas emissions, but Europe has the ambition in the Green Deal and in the climate law to become the first climate neutral continent. And if you look at the blue shaded area here, which would be European policies and national policies that are currently planned, we see that we would not reach that climate neutrality, which is, of course, the significance of the debate that is taking place in the Parliament and in the Council now to move to minus 50 and minus 55 percent uh, of emission cuts in 2030, 2030, because that opens up pathways to indeed uh, be in line with the Paris Agreement and be in line with the ambitions of the European Green Deal. In terms of impact, it is also absolutely need to commit to the Paris Agreement. These are uh, numbers about the frequency of heat waves projected for the end of this century. And you, if you look at the Mediterranean region, uh, heat waves will become an endemic part of uh, life for many months of the year there. And that, of course, has impacts on human health and also, on the other side of the slide, impacts on agricultural yields, where we see in the Mediterranean area losses of uh, rain-fed maize yields that are 20, 30, 40, and up to 50 percent, which of course sends a strong signal to the farming community about adaptation uh, and to uh, all of us about the importance of strong mitigation measures. When we look at health and well-being, 
And I think this is a critical if we want to speak to European citizens about the necessity to move towards a more sustainable society, because it will be a society that improves health and well-being. We can tell that there is a picture that is a bit mixed. We see serious green colors when it comes to past trends in air pollution. We see a more mixed color when it comes to uh, uh, noise pollution and to chemical uh, pollution. And we see some uh, improvements when it comes to climate adaptation, uh, but we see uh, concerning trends when it comes to sticking to policy objectives and delivering overall. The good news is indeed that air pollution has been improving in Europe almost everywhere and in a consistent way. On the other hand, we know that the World Health Organization air quality guidelines uh, stipulate that more than 80% of European urban citizens are still living in uh, air pollution uh, and air quality that is not good for their health, which makes us conclude that at this moment, more than 450,000 Europeans die prematurely because of air quality in the places where they live. It is, of course, a goal of the European institutions to increasingly align policies with these health standards over time. And it has an impact, of course, on years of life lost. And if you look at the map of Europe, it is clear that uh, the Eastern European countries are struggling there. And this is linked to the energy system, but also to household heating, which is still based in many places on coal and wood burning. But there are other countries that are also seeing very significant impacts of air pollution on uh, human health. On the site of chemical pollution, it is clear that Europe has the best and strongest system to look at risks of chemicals. It is embedded in the European Chemicals Agency and the REACH legislation, and of course also in the European Food Safety Authority in Parma. But even then we know that we will have to look at the chemical system and move it in line with uh, the sustainability criteria. So asking ourselves the serious question about is it fit for purpose for to fight climate change, to move to a circular economy and to move towards an economy that protects human health will be the next step. And the iceberg here uh, also has the meaning that a lot of it is below the water. We don't know yet. Uh, and that is where we should focus our knowledge. We also know that about one hundred million of Europeans live in air pollution that is above the health standards. And we've seen the impact of the measures of the corona crisis. Uh, this is mainly linked to road traffic. And in many places, we've seen that changes are possible and that people have uh, been living in less uh, air pollution uh, prone areas. Industrial pollution is a positive story. We've seen uh, decreasing of almost every single industrial pollutant, which is a very positive signal for uh, not only human health, uh, food safety, but also for biodiversity. We have seen these challenges. We dealt with them in the past, well, primarily through what we have called environmental policy integration, making sure that the environment is taken up in other policies. But we have to be uh, honest here, this has been in many cases not very successful. If we look at 25 years of integrating environmental standards in transport, we have to come to the conclusion that aviation, but also navigation and also land uh, transportation with cars and vans and trucks has not delivered. And that has not been because we don't have cleaner engines. Those are the objective of the legislation but primarily because we drive more, we fly more, and globalization has stimulated an enormous increase in international navigation. So we, we need to reflect on the real driving forces and probably not sweep the floor with the faucet still open. We see the same in agriculture, where the greening of the common agricultural policy has been largely ineffective 
although well intended a lot of the pollution to soil water air and food is still there unsustainable practices are still putting a threat to biodiversity and natural capital and we see this in the critical nitrogen inputs to the agricultural areas in europe another we have been jumping maybe to to conclusions that were too quick if we would have done what some would have preached on biofuels 15 years ago, we may have seen an enormous impact on biodiversity because we would have traded agricultural land and biodiversity massively to use biofuel in a century in a in a century old technology called the combustion engine, which we now understand has little future in a sustainable mobility system. So what is then? The, the way to go. Well, we think in the agency, in our report, that systemic change, focusing on the food system, and I didn't say agriculture because that is only one part of the food system. The energy system, the mobility system, and the built environment are absolutely critical And looking at the interlinkages. We need policy frameworks that address these systemic challenges and also address policy gaps like food, like land and soil, like chemicals and i'm very happy to say that those are of course embedded now in the european green deal to a, a, a serious extent it also means leveraging the power of cities businesses and communities it's obvious that this is not just work for central governments because they will entail serious societal uh, shifts as well it means that we will have to speed up and scale up, experiment, accelerate, and institutionalize solutions that will lead us to a more stable, sustainable society. And Europe is conducting policies to support that. At the same time, we have to be clear, we will also have to phase out and break down unsustainable practices. And the sooner we do that, the more space we create for the green solutions to break through and to create an economy that is fit for purpose under the boundary conditions of the 21st century. And of course, this is where some of the conflicts will be because of vested interests, because of uh, stepping out of things in which we feel comfortable, but it is a step we need to take, which is why I think we need enabling conditions. And I think the Just Transition Fund, the, the money that is made available now under the the funds to get out of this corona crisis can play a major role indeed in enabling stepping out of unsustainable practices and stimulating sustainability. The biggest risk we see in terms of investments is that we would stick to what is called marginal efficiency gains. We keep investing in the, the systems that we have, the technology that we've known for a long time, and making it marginally more efficient. Now, any economist or engineer will tell you that this is costly and it has by definition marginal limits and it will lead so investors say to stranded assets and i would say on top of that if you don't want stranded assets you don't want stranded regions or stranded workers either so moving from that logic which has no future and will not bring us to the european green deal in 2050 we need to look at investments that are transitional towards the future I would like to end with two slides in conclusion. I think our report shows that we do have to focus on implementation in the member states. We have to do things better. We need to stick to our promises because that would mean that the picture looks different already. But on top of that, we need to use sustainability as the guiding principle and do things in a much more systemic way. The third conclusion is that we need to make the right investments transformative investments and not marginal efficiency gains in dead-end streets. And in order to do that, we will need to foster innovation, not only in technology, but I think throughout society. And my last slate, slide makes the clear link with the post-corona time. When we presented our SOER in, in December, uh, early December, the week thereafter, the European Commission presented its a European Green Deal, and pretty soon thereafter, we were in the corona period. I think we need to understand the links between these elements. We need alignment, indeed, between the stimulus money and the European Green Deal objectives, has been, as has been made so clear 
by uh, Commission President von der Leyen, but also by Prime Minister Conte and uh, the, the President of the European Parliament, Sassoli. I think it's important to avoid double costing. If we grow out of this crisis without regard for sustainability, we will pay now to get out of the crisis and we will then pay again to clean up the unsustainability effects of that economic recovery. I also think it's stimulating us to give fundamental answers to a question about our disturbed relationship with nature. The signals we are getting from the planet, so to speak, are rather obvious and we need to take them seriously. And I think we also can find solutions that are a response to Europe's position in a world that is increasingly complex, is dealing with risks and uncertainty. I would like to stop my presentation here by thanking the many, many Italian colleagues who have contributed to the SOER uh, report. They are in ISPRA, they are in many other institutions. We cherish the very valued uh, relationship which we have with the Italian colleagues. And we think that collectively we can provide knowledge and understanding that will be needed in the next decade and decades to make this European Green Deal a success and become the sustainable society that we are collectively, collectively aspiring. Over to the colleagues in ISPRA now. Thank you very much.